In Fairfax County, Virginia, police find a decomposed body, but have no report of a crime. In Fort Myers, Florida, a killer confesses to a grisly crime, but the police cannot find a body. A serial killer may go free unless police find the evidence to put him behind bars. In each case, forensic scientists must find proof of the crime in the bones of the murder victim. Using scientific studies of human decay to find out when the victim died so the killer may be traced. Hoping to prove there is no perfect crime. That dead men do talk. Nobody should die that way. I've never seen anything that horrific. One of the duties of a pathologist is to determine the cause of death. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Download Veely now. December 1993. In a wooded area near Washington, D.C., a surveyor has made a gruesome discovery. While mapping out a new suburb in the Virginia countryside, he has stumbled on a body buried in a shallow grave. Officers from the Fairfax County Police Department arrive at the secluded area where the body had been found. The first homicide detective on the scene is Detective Jerry Farrell. How you doing, Officer Gregory? What do you got? There's a human skull right over here. Okay. Take a look. The police assume it's a homicide. But there are no immediate clues to help identify the victim. And Lieutenant Wilson, he's there. You want to take a look? What you're going to need is uh, start mapping out the area. Secure this area okay. here, and then we're going to need at least 50-foot area perimeter set up around this one. Yes, sir. The team of investigators will search a wide area. Scavengers have dragged parts of the body away. The police meticulously document the position of the body with photographs, sketches, and notes. Detective Dennis Wilson heads the cold case squad, investigating crimes where the trail of evidence has gone cold. In such cases, every clue, every piece of evidence, no matter how small, may be the key to solving the crime. From bits of clothing and hair, detectives Wilson and Farrell are fairly sure the victim is a woman. Since decomposition often leaves fatty residues, the officers take soil samples near the body. Chemical analysis could help determine when the victim was buried. Well, you only have one chance at a crime scene, and you have to do it right the first time. So you slow things down at that point. There's no hurry. The body's obviously been there for some time. Uh, we're going to try to gather all the evidence we can and make sure we don't miss anything. There just may be one small little clue here that's going to lead to either her identity or the identity of the perpetrator. Because the body is so badly decomposed,
the detectives make a call to nearby Washington, D.C. Dr. Douglas Owsley of the Smithsonian Institution is an anthropologist whose specialty is identifying human remains, from soldiers who died in the Civil War to the modern-day victims of homicide. He has testified in many criminal trials as a forensic scientist. Forensic meaning science used as proof in a court of law. Receiving the call from the Fairfax County Police, he agrees to visit the site where the skeleton has been found. In the usual case, murder victims are assigned to medical examiners who dissect the body to find the cause of death. But medical examiners are accustomed to dealing with fresh bodies. Here, only bones are left to tell the tale, requiring the special skills of the anthropologist. It takes three days of careful excavation to take the body from the ground. Back in his laboratory, Owsley hunts for signs of the victim's age, sex, and the manner of death. It is immediately apparent that the victim is female. The pelvic bone is wider in females to accommodate childbirth. Though Owsley believes the victim was a young adult, it's difficult to be more precise. She does not show any signs of arthritis, not, not uh, severe arthritis. If you look at her spinal column, there's only minor changes, no development of arthritis. Her pubic bones are showing a stage of maturity that would be consistent with somebody that is about 30 years of age. In a young person, the sutures of the skull are plainly visible. As a person grows older, the sutures tend to fuse together. In the victim's skull, the sutures are starting to disappear, confirming that the victim was a young adult. Only five feet, one inch tall, she'd been stabbed repeatedly. The knife blade leaving marks on the collarbone, ribs, and vertebrae. Looking at the pattern of cuts in the bone, you can tell that the individual was, was behind her at least some of the time. Uh, she has knife wounds that penetrated in, in the back and the midline. Uh, the cut that is in the, in the clavicle and the collarbone there's many different positions that could account for that, but one would be the individual reaching over her. Attaching a name to the body will not be easy. To shed more light on this mysterious case, police must determine the identity of the victim. In Fort Myers, Florida, police will have the opposite problem a crime without a body. 911, what is your emergency? Yeah. Okay, one moment, sir. Betty, I have a man on the phone advised he just murdered someone. In a police communication center in Fort Myers, Florida, a 911 call will lead to the discovery of a grisly crime dating to 1989. 911, what is your emergency? I'd like to report a homicide on Piney Road. A murder? Where did it happen? I'm only calling in because I should confess that's what I did. And you did it? Yeah. The caller reports a murder he has recently committed. Why did you do that? I don't know. He says he's thought of turning himself in, but hasn't decided yet. Right, are you going to wait there for us? The 911 call is traced to a shopping center phone booth. The operator tries to keep the killer on the line, while a message goes out to police units in the area. Lake County 2, 11, 1, 1065, a possible signal 5 at Coral Gate Shopping Center. Or Orange Grove in Pondella. Orange Grove in Pondella. Officer Paul Rose monitors the call and finds no one at the shopping center phone booth where the call originated. But less than a mile from the shopping center, he has spotted a possible suspect.
The suspect had been walking hurriedly at the side of the road, away from the direction of the shopping center. The suspect, whose name is Paul Klein, quickly admits he made the 911 call confessing murder. He is advised of his rights and taken into custody. The previous night, he'd broken into a house and strangled an elderly woman on the couch where she lay. There is no sign of anything missing. Robbery had not been the motive. Lieutenant Jeff Taylor, entering the house, found the victim just as Klein had described her. But he would soon find out that she had not been Klein's first victim. Klein related to me that he heard voices, and the voices made him become angry. And every time he became angry, he had to kill someone. And when he said that, it indicated to me that perhaps there were other victims also. And I asked him at that time uh, if he had killed before, and he said yes twice. Klein had murdered one other woman in a trailer some months before. But his first victim had been a friend named Danny Webster, killed a year and a half earlier in August 1989. Luring Webster into a field to look for aluminum cans, Klein had beaten him to death with a lead pipe. A crime scene search unit scours the area where the killing allegedly occurred. Here you go, I got something over here. Oh yeah? What is it? Does it look like it's been there a while or? We had information that we believed at the time that um, the crime was committed, the, the original act of the homicide was committed in this field. So what we did, we did a grid search of this whole field, and upon doing that, we located a shoe. Uh, it's early to tell right now if it actually belongs to the victim, but we believe there's a good possibility that it does. Therefore, once we found the, uh, the shoe, we have to treat it as evidence. According to Klein's confession, he had returned to the scene of the crime three days after the murder. Arriving at night to avoid detection, he swam with the body to a marshy swamp island, where he dismembered the corpse with an ax and a paring knife. After disposing of Webster's body so thoroughly and getting away with his crime for a year and a half, Klein has now decided to confess. The crime scene search officers find a small piece of bone, photographed exactly where it is found. But they will not find a body. Without a body, police do not have enough evidence to convict. Detective Jack Shell interrogated Klein under tight security. Klein had once bent a stop sign with his bare hands. We needed a positive identification of the body. Although we had somebody telling us who they killed and that they killed them, we still have to prove who was killed, how they were killed, and when they were killed to the best we can. It's the corpus delecti, the body of the crime. We have to be able to establish that, yes, this person died, and that this person did it. I, mean, I guess I must actually hit him about, I don't know, maybe more than 200 times. I'm not sure. I just kept whacking at everything. On, I hit him in the legs, the arms, everywhere I could get his face. I, just his head the region was more where I actually hit more than anything. But uh, that was after he was already dead, too, you know, I just kept hitting him. Klein's confession by itself is not enough to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. The police must find the body. 
Vine pointed out the marshy island where he says he left the dismembered corpse. But even if police can find it, it will be hard to identify after a year and a half in the swamp. The taller bush. The taller bush. The case will go to Dr. William Maples of the University of Florida, a world-renowned authority on the identification of skeletal remains. In 1991, he led the team that exhumed the bones of President Zachary Taylor, who died mysteriously in 1850. Some historians say Taylor was poisoned, making him, not Abraham Lincoln, the first American president to be assassinated. After testing the dead president's hair and fingernails for poison, Dr. Maples laid the body and the assassin theories to rest. In the case of Paul Klein, it is immediately clear to Maples he is dealing with a possible psychopath totally unaffected by death. Well, bodies in Florida tend to bloat very rapidly. Florida is known for its sunshine and good weather, especially in the area of Fort Myers where this took place. Uh, so the first thing that our uh, killer attempted to use was a paring knife. Uh, it is very flexible, it is light, it may be sharp, it may be uh, serrated, and may be very, very effective sometimes in cutting up bones. The, the so-called Ginzu steak knife is amazingly flexible and yet will go right through bone if it's properly used. Uh, so our killer sticks the knife into this bloated body and out pours all over him yellow and green discharge, foul-smelling fluid. Uh, this is enough to, to really disturb anyone, even if they, they weren't disturbed to start with. But the killer's use of a paring knife may be the key to identifying the victim's remains and corroborating Klein's confession. If we take a paring knife and rub uh, along a stick or a bone or whatever the case might be, you notice that the blade jumps and chatters. Uh, this chatter produces a, an interrupted type of cutting on the bone surface. And we look for this evidence of chattering, and that tells us how flexible or inflexible the blade is. On the other hand, if we take a good heavy bladed sharp knife and cut on the bone, it doesn't chatter, it simply shaves the bone. And this is evidence of a heavier, less flexible blade. Crime scene search officers arrive at the island where Klein left the dismembered body. If they can find bones that were sliced with a paring knife, they'll have strong proof that Klein's confession is real. Hey Chris. How you doing? We're gonna earn this one. We're gonna earn this one. Klein was to have accompanied the officers himself, but in the boat going over to the island, he'd been much too excited at the prospect of seeing his victim's remains. For their own safety, the officers decided to search without Klein's assistance. It's a serious mission, for unlike his other crimes, the murder of Danny Webster was vicious enough to send Klein to Florida's electric chair, or else prove beyond all doubt he's a dangerous psychopath to be put away indefinitely. He seemed like a normal person. Uh, you didn't notice any psychological problems or anything, but the more it went on and the more I realized he was telling me the truth and that these gory facts he was telling me really did happen, then I'm beginning to think, you know, we got a, got a real weirdo here that can do this and talk about it so calmly and so intelligently. Klein had a nickname he didn't like. Because his arms extended out from his body as he walked, kids made fun of him, calling him Popeye. 
just had a, uh, what I did is... He'd uh, killed Danny Webster for calling him names, repeating time after time it was because Webster had harassed him. How are you feeling? Uh, I'm feeling pretty good. Uh, everything's all right. I just uh, have to go ahead and, I don't know, I think I feel almost a little dizzy for that matter. I have to eat a little bit of something, take my medication. Is that person yeah. in the marsh, Danny Webster? Uh, yes, ma'am. Yep, that's him. Or that, that was did, him. Why did uh, he Uh, he was always being cruel and, I don't know, calling me names and stuff. And I decided to go for it. Watch your head, Danny. Hey, thank you, ma'am. I appreciate everything. Watch yours. The island where Klein left the body is partially submerged and subject to changing tides. The logistics of finding evidence are very difficult. Finally, more bones are found. The body is in pieces, just as Klein had said. I asked him, how did you take this body apart? I believe his response was just like I always do. I took off the left leg, the left arm, the head, the right arm, the right leg, in a circular motion like that. And he had used a hatchet, axe. He told me where the axe was, which was in another state. Him and his father had went to uh, their home in another state and left it there before he came back. Pieces of bone found on the marshy island are sent to the FBI for examination. The FBI confirms that the bones show evidence of hatchet trauma. An axe or hatchet had been used to cut the body apart. But according to his harrowing confession, Klein had reserved special treatment for the victim's head. Yeah, Yip got his head off with a paring knife and, and uh, the head, uh, there was more or less like in pieces and I tossed it right on an embankment about 25, 30 feet from the mangroves and I stuck it there for like, uh, see, I had it there for like the longest time, I guess something like three and a half months. He told me that he would, he took the head and kept it to come back and visit it. He would visit it every night and talk to it. And after about two weeks, it got to the point where it was deteriorated to the extent that he didn't want it anymore, so he discarded it. Klein had carried the head around with him in a paper sack, often engaging it in conversation. Spotting a police car on one occasion, he panicked and threw the head into a waterway but he could not remember where. A police dive team searches the area where Klein may have discarded Danny Webster's skull. It is an area of murky waters frequented by alligators. They find nothing but coconuts. Unless the head is found, it may be impossible to identify the remains as those of Danny Webster. Here, as in suburban Virginia, the police must team up with science to bring a killer to justice. At the Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C., tourists gaze at the wonders of the natural world. They are unaware that a few feet away, a storage area holds the unnatural work of a vicious killer. Police in Fairfax County, Virginia, have called on forensic scientist Doug Owsley to help identify the victim of a brutal homicide. The body has decomposed. Only a skeleton remains. Owsley has determined that the victim was a female from 27 to 34 years old. She died from repeated stab wounds. But who is she and where did she come from? 
When you're, when you're working with police cases and working on problems of human identification, often when the remains come into the laboratory or when you're involved in the recovery, the identification follows very quickly. There's someone that's missing, there are records that can be obtained, dental records or medical records that you can compare against and you can get that person identified within a very short period of time. But uh, police in Fairfax do, County have found no immediate links to a missing person. What's your phone number? Owsley will need every piece of evidence he can find to produce a life history of the victim, to be matched, hopefully, with someone who disappeared as many as six years before. Personal effects found with the victim are minimal. An inexpensive hair clip, a hair pick. Her blue jeans had rotted away. Her synthetic underwear remained. Lightweight sandals indicate that the crime was committed in warm weather. Her hair was a light brown color, as, as determined from analysis of hair found at the, at, the, at the site. We know that her fingernails were painted from fingernails that were recovered at the site. Uh, it was a, a dark, glossy pink in color. So there's a lot of details. On the earrings found near the body is a fragment of human tissue. The metal of the earring had protected it from bacterial decay. The earrings are included in sketches distributed nationwide. Slowly, painfully, the haunting details of the victim's life are coming into focus. In the spinal column are signs of trauma. Depressions in the vertebra are evidence that the discs between the vertebrae have herniated. The victim may have held a job that required heavy lifting. She'd once taken care of her teeth, but in the last years of her life had allowed them to decay. She had fillings on the front teeth to maintain her appearance, but five of her molars are missing. Black stains on the teeth are evidence the victim was probably a smoker. Overall, the, the impression that you would have, but it's an impression based not only on the dentition, but perhaps some of the things found with it, it, it would suggest that it was an individual that, that did not have a lot of money, that uh, fairly, fairly limited financial resources. The information gleaned by Owsley is passed on to the Fairfax County Police Department, where Detective Bruce Guth heads the homicide branch. In, in our jurisdiction, uh, many of the murders are um, committed by people who know, know the victim. In the normal case, once the victim yeah, is known, the police will talk to neighbors and relatives about the victim's lifestyle, who her friends were, and her enemies. A chain of evidence often will lead to the guilty party. In this case, we don't know the identity, so it makes it difficult to to uh, really go much further till we know who it is. Detail by detail, Fairfax County Police re-examine the evidence found at the scene. A sketch of what the victim may have looked like is distributed to police across the country, along with other details of the case. Even though this case is two years old, I'm still actively pursuing leads that have occurred. I receive inquiries approximately two to three a month. Uh, just recently, I received one from Philadelphia, New York City, and Ohio. Uh, Despite the continuing efforts of the Fairfax County Police, there is no matchup of the murder victim with a missing person. To facilitate the search for the victim's identity, Doug Owsley provides data for a second composite sketch using an FBI computer program. When you, when you look at a skull and you're trying to assess what this individual looked like, the basic form is going to be defined by the skull itself. In relation to that, then you take into consideration the clothing that's found, for instance, because the clothing helps you, you gain a, an idea as to the size, the weight of the individual, for instance. Starting with an image of the skull, the computer adds successive layers of detail. 
Markers indicate the probable thickness of facial tissue. The measurements are based on population studies of similar age and gender. Hair found at the scene, along with the plastic hair clip and hair pick, suggest a possible hairstyle. The victim had an overbite, a gap in her front teeth, and a cosmetic filling. Since these features would have been visible in life, the victim is shown smiling in the final illustration. But despite the pains taken to create a lifelike image, there is still no response when the image is published nationwide. Part of the problem, the police are still unsure when the murder occurred. When discovered in 1993, the bones had been dry. The flesh had long since rotted away. You'd have to say that it would be at least a year and a half before that that this could have happened. But in reality, I think it could extend back further in time. And so if we take the, the maximum range, one of the things found in a pocket was a quarter that dates to 1980. So looking at the time frame, we're, we're in terms of the extremes, probably talking between 1991 and 1980. The problem of dating murder victims found long after the crime has occurred may soon have an answer. At a body farm in Tennessee, an unusual study is underway using the volunteered flesh and bones of the dead. In Fairfax County, Virginia, police continue their search for clues to identify a woman found in the Washington suburbs. In Fort Myers, Florida, a confessed serial killer has led police to a headless body, barely identifiable as human. In both cases, work done at the Tennessee Anthropology Research Facility, or TARF, will prove invaluable. Its director is Dr. William Bass, a forensic anthropologist at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. His expertise is the human skeleton. Individual who'd been dead about 10 days, found out on the edge of the river. When a person is recently dead, morphological features such as prints on the fingers and palms can help with identification. When these features are gone and only the bones remain, the case is one for forensic anthropology. Bass's facility receives on average one body a week for identification. Parts of Tennessee have become a dumping ground for murder victims. We don't think of the interstates as being avenues of crime, but they're absolute avenues of crime. So you can kidnap somebody in Chicago. You can come down I-75, which comes down through Cincinnati, through Lexington, Kentucky, into Tennessee. The first real area that you get to on I-75 going toward Florida that is really rural is Tennessee. And we get a lot of bodies thrown out there. With so many bodies, Bass has invented a boxing system for storage. Every skeleton gets his own box. So we, uh, you want to box them because if you don't, they will get lost, they will get dirty. On the shelves surrounding him are over 2,000 skeletons sent to Bass's facility by medical examiners around the state. With the help of graduate students, Bass assists the police in determining the sex, race, and other identifying characteristics of unclaimed bodies. But in doing his work, Bass became acutely aware there were no reliable statistics on rates of human decay. He established near Knoxville an outdoor preserve known informally as the Body Farm. Here, he has planted not living things, but dead. Human bodies left in the open to decompose. It's an experiment that will tell him how bodily decomposition is affected by weather, climate, and the degree of exposure to the elements. This is a body that we're studying, uh, the effects of, of the covering of the body that the maggots leave. This body has been outside for a year, 
Maggots have eaten its inside away, but left some of the skin for protection. Maggots don't like sunlight, and uh, what they do is they leave this as an umbrella to protect themselves from the sun. And so you get bodies like this um, that will have the covering on them holding the bones together, um, although there are no internal organs left there at all. The specimens used for Bass's experiments come from two basic sources, those who have donated their bodies to science and unclaimed bodies sent to the facility by medical examiners. After the bodies have lain in the open to decompose, they are brought back to the laboratory for analysis. Dissection will tell how their exposure to the elements has affected their skin, bones, and tissue. These statistics will then aid police departments in determining how long a newly discovered homicide victim has been dead. To keep out intruders with morbid curiosities, security guards keep the body farm under tight surveillance. Bass has attempted to duplicate all the common ways in which killers dispose of their victims. Well, we try to keep as honest a setting as we can. Uh, we try not to make anything artificial. It's, it's exactly the way it is in nature. What we have here is an, is an automobile that we have been looking at the decay rates of people in automobiles, both in the passenger compartment and in the trunk. A body placed in the trunk for observation has since been removed, but its byproducts remain. Tiny pupil cases from which flies have emerged. A matter of minutes after death has occurred, flies are attracted to the body to lay their eggs. The eggs will hatch into larvae, or maggots, that feed on the decaying flesh before turning into flies. We can tell you that this individual has been in this trunk at least 21 days from the fly pupae that are, are present, from the pupal cases that are, are present here. In the back seat of the car, another body has been removed, yep. again leaving a clue as to time of death. Hair mass. What's called the hair mass falls off a dead body after a week's time. Bass has found that in enclosed vehicles, the buildup of heat often accelerates the process of decomposition. Some of the bodies have been dead only a week. Well, he hadn't gone very far. Well, well, they're both at about the same stage, aren't they? Just on that body. Others are much older. Well, there are there are some maggots right there, but that maggot is frozen. Uh, he's gotten away from the warmth of the body and uh, didn't make it back to the body, so. There are a couple right there. I'm going to push this back just a little bit more here, and uh, we'll see if we can't get under there. And I'm not really sure. Well, you see, there are lots of maggots. See, there are hundreds and hundreds of maggots in there, uh, and they are either slowed down. They're not. They're not doing much right now because it's so cold. Each month, Bass sends bone and hair samples to the FBI for analysis. The samples come from a number of different specimens in a variety of locales within the farm. The FBI will study how time, exposure to the elements, and the environment in which a body is found may alter its DNA. You can do DNA analysis on the maggots and they will produce the same DNA. If the individual has, um, has been on drugs, the maggots will pick up those drugs. You can tell from analysis of the maggot. Also, the volatile fatty acids, which are that, the goo that you see there, those are what are called the volatile fatty acids that leach out of bodies. Now, we've been able to take this material and analyze that and determine the length of time since death up to about two years. 
In other parts of the facility, bodies lie in coffins above ground. Drainage tubes allow the testing of fluids and air samples without opening the coffin lid. This is Nearby, bodies are buried in coffins six feet underground, with a culvert allowing access. Here, Bass and his associates study how subterranean burial affects the rate of decay. Since killers have been known to dismember their victims and scatter them around, another area is set aside for body parts. It is not always an exact science. But Dr. Bass's work, the first of its kind, will help the police with murder victims found long after the crime. In the case of Danny Webster in Florida, police have only part of the body. The killer has done a thorough job of dismembering and scattering the remains. Filling in the grisly details of murder and mutilation will be the job of forensic science. At the Lee County Sheriff's Office in Fort Myers, Florida, Paul Klein has confessed to the murder of Danny Webster. But the killer has carved up the body and disposed of its head. The few bones found on a marshy island are a year and a half old. It may be impossible to prove beyond a reasonable doubt they are the bones of Danny Webster. We went in and we come back out, so Klein had been relentless in attempting to conceal his crime. Before decapitating the body, he had pulled out the teeth, knowing they're often used to identify the victim. He explained that instead of digging a normal grave-type hole, that he dug a round hole as if to put trash or something in it. He set the victim down in it, buttocks first, and shoved him into the hole by his shoulders. When he didn't go in all the way, he jumped up and down on the body until he was able to get it deep enough into the hole that he thought he had it hidden. Then he pulled weeds and dirt over it and laid on his belly, and his words were slithered back into the water like a big gator and swam back home. Is Klein a psychopath, or is he a man who has plotted and planned the perfect crime? OK, a perfect crime. Let's think, how about Jimmy Hoffa? How far have we gotten on Jimmy Hoffa solving? We don't even know where he is. How can we solve the crime if we don't know where he is? You see, so somebody, I mean, somebody's already thought of this and said, you know, if you leave the body, it's a good chance you're going to be caught. Because there's all these hair and fiber sections of the FBI and the forensic anthropologists of the world all over. All my colleagues were out there trying to figure this out. But if you don't have a body, how do you know you've got a crime, you say? Detective Harry executed a search warrant at Klein's apartment. It was soon apparent Klein may have learned the techniques of killing from books. Um, we found uh, probably every true life murder story that was ever written, uh, like Son of Sam, uh, The Hillside Strangler. It was just book after book after book. From sparse remains, forensic science must identify the body of Danny Webster. If not, the case may be lost. In order to corroborate Klein's confession and make the case hold up in court, anthropologist William Maples will try to determine the age, sex, and race of the partial skeleton. This is the shaft of the bone. This is the epiphysis, the end of the bone. And they start from separate origins in a child. Uh, and they slowly change shape as the epiphyses reach the end of their growth, they become fused to the shafts of bone. On the bones in this case, fusion is not yet complete. Maples is able to put the age of the victim between 17 and 23, the same age as Danny Webster. Determining sex is almost always a matter of studying the pelvic bones, narrower in males than females. The victim in this case was clearly a male. But determining race will be more difficult, especially with the head missing. Dr. Maples uses the femur, or thigh bone, to distinguish Caucasian and black. In a Caucasian, the femur is bowed enough to allow his knuckle to pass under. 
in the case of a black individual, the shaft tends to be much flatter and straighter, and there is no anterior bowing. The amount of curvature in the femur clearly indicated to me that we were dealing with a white male. Finally, Maples examines the bones for evidence of the chatter marks that a paring knife would leave if used to dismember the body. Killers, by and large, aren't stupid enough to use paring knives. So we don't have a lot of evidence of that. But the results are positive. By the end of his examination, Maples has conclusive proof that the bones match the description of Danny Webster. The necessary corroboration of Klein's confession is in place. For, for Lieutenant time. Jeff Taylor, the case is closed. Um, Paul Klein is presently in uh, an institution uh, in Chattahoochee, Florida for um, uh, mentally insane. But in Fairfax County, Virginia, police have a tougher problem. A murder victim remains unidentified. A killer may go undetected, free to kill again. More than two years have passed since the discovery of a female body in the Virginia countryside near Washington, D.C. Fairfax County investigators, including detectives Jerry Farrell and Dennis Wilson, have sent out extensive information on the case, including descriptions of the victim, dental charts, and a description of some, but not all, of the wounds discovered by forensic expert Doug Owsley. Persons have been known to confess crimes they did not commit, having learned the details of the crime from public sources. By withholding certain information, the police can be sure when a confession is fabricated or genuine. All right, this is gonna be the cut right here. Far from having a confession, police in Fairfax County, after two years of searching missing person files, still do not know who the victim is. Even today, we think a lot about her and, and are, are hoping that through the facial reproductions that have been done, that someone might be able to recognize her, might be able to contact the police and offer new insights, because this is, this is somebody that we need to get identified and we certainly need to, to, in order to hopefully prevent this from happening again, find out who did this. We've sent hundreds of leads out, hundreds of posters. Uh, we're gonna probably revise this again at least once or twice a year. We try to cover it on the TV stations, the media. Uh, we try to get the uh, newspapers interested to run the picture. We run not only the artist renditions, but we also run pictures of the clothing. Uh, this is no way a case that's just sitting on a shelf and nothing being done. With a growing population and more and more people on the move, many crimes may never be solved. Victims like the one found in Fairfax County her friends and relatives unaware of her death may remain unidentified, her killer free to kill again. I think that uh, homicide investigations are getting a little more difficult. Uh, the national trend is more stranger on stranger murders. As in past years, it was family members, domestic kind of murders. Uh, nationally, there's more stranger, stranger murders. And forensics becomes a very important part of the investigation. Was this the work of a serial killer? Doug Owsley believes not. The body was buried in haste, the killer lacking the tools to dismember it so it would never be found. Serial killers, like Florida's Paul Klein, are far more efficient. You don't gain necessarily that same sort of sophistication in this case. Certainly it led to a tragic end, but uh, in terms of accomplishing what he set out to do, he was, he was much less prepared. On the other hand, um, he was able to take someone's life and he's been able to get away with it all these years, and so, and so there's, there's just some piece that we haven't uh, been able to put together to, to get on his trail yet. Despite the obstacles to solving the case, detectives in Fairfax County have not given up. Somebody sooner or later is going to talk about this. That's one of the premises of a cold case squad, that 
relationships are changing and uh, technology's changing, things are becoming more advanced. I'm optimistic that this case could get solved. It's, uh, we keep working at it, chipping away at it. Eventually, it's gonna it's gonna unfold. Oh yeah, I optimistic. Believe we're gonna do it. Sometimes things just take a little bit longer. That's all. William Maples, for one, believes that few killers escape detection. No, no, of course not. They, they don't play by our rules. Uh, they, they will take chances, do things that we wouldn't do. Uh, they, they just don't play by the rules. And that's helpful to us because that means that they make a lot of mistakes. And by taking chances, they invariably end up getting caught. Thrill is a big element in that. And thrill means that they're taking chances. And God love them. The more chances they take, the more chances we have of catching them.